Okay, and here, so so here's so here's what happened. I got on the plane, and uh, I was getting into to the airline, and I said, "Do I need to show you guys a burial permit because I'm taking my father's ashes back to Chicago?" And the lady's eyes get all wide. She went and got her manager and came back. Oh, I'm so sorry, I, you know, for your losses. Would you like to pre-board with him? Pre-board? Sure. So they said, we'll call security and let them know you're going through the, you know, checkpoint. So I went through airport security and I got to the gate and I said to the lady, I said, that she told me I could pre-board, but it doesn't say it on the ticket. And she said, uh, and I said, I have my father's urn. She said, oh, I'm not going to stop you from getting on the plane. So I got on the plane. I sit down on the plane. I sat down. I went to the, the stewardess in the back, the flight attendant, and I said, hey, uh, is this plane filled or can I put this urn on the seat next to me? Oh, my. So, so, so as soon as the plane got in the air, they grabbed me and they moved me up. Yes, Steve. I didn't get first class, but they moved me up to, uh, to emergency exit row. For those of you that don't know, I'm six foot five, okay? I don't fit well in planes. They don't build planes for me. So that's um, so that's what happened. And anyway, we got to Chicago. The first night we went to Richards. And we hung out at Richards for the evening. We met some really cool guys there. It was this little Joe Pesci impersonator guy who was fun. I have some video of him. And we did a little videoing in Richards. I asked if it was okay, you know, uh, out of respect. If, and they told me it would as long as I, you know, didn't put anybody in the in the frame, which I did a good job of not doing until the very end of the night when I accidentally moved the camera and then I got yelled at. But anyway, we, uh, that was so that was the first night on Thursday, Friday. Friday, Art Kelly, who Art is a member of Bilia, uh dealer. He worked with Henry Hill, Frank Collada. He works with OJ, all of the uh, sports members. He's like the biggest sports memorabilia guy on the West Coast. So, um, so anyway, Art and I, we got together with Joe, Frank's brother. We had coffee over at his house in the morning, and then we drove and we went around town. We went to a bunch of different locations. We went and hit the cemeteries. We went to the um, the rectory where Frank robbed the Brinks truck. So we, we got footage of all of this. Uh, we went past some homes of different people. Uh, we went around Chicago, it's what we did. And we made videos of it. So we did that all day Friday. And then Saturday, we had Lewis with us as well. Uh, and also Steady came with, and we, we all drove around on Saturday and, and that because of the time change is when I realized two hours after now that I missed going live so uh, anyhow so that's what that's what happened and I'm reading all of your no we didn't go into the suburbs Sean um, we, we were on the west side but we didn't go south uh, we didn't do that we were going to uh, uh, really wanted to go see Al Capone's house but Joey said we'd be taking our lives in our hands if we went down there and and I last time I was in the south side of Chicago it was yeah anyway okay so and then so Saturday we drove around did all of that and then Sunday was the luncheon which we had over at Gibson's uh, Gibson Steakhouse so that's what we did it was a it was a fun time uh, and 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 then I think it was Sunday no Monday we got up. And that was the day I went out with uh, Joe over at Disorderly Product News. And if you guys haven't checked out his channel, you should check out his channel. It's pretty cool. He's an interesting guy. Um, and he has an interesting channel. So, anyhow, uh, let me read a little of your comments. Nice to see you're going strong. Thanks, Larry. I am working on it and uh, just trying to keep everything going. Steve Cutler, Sammy has his own channel. Yeah, Sammy the Bull started a channel as well. Um, the upper crust. I went to ask for a blueberry pie. Frank then told me they sell pizza pies, not regular pies. Back when the upper crust first opened, I went in and asked for a blueberry pie. Frank told me they sell pizza pies, not regular pies. Wow, you thought it was a pie giant, huh? <laughs> anyway, so next week, um, hey, Gary, thanks for prescribing, buddy. I appreciate your support. Thank you very much. That's awesome. 
Uh, deal with the Dallas family. Did Frank deal with the Dallas family? No. But I'll tell you something. After all the fun that Art Kelly and I had in Chicago doing the, you know, going around, um, I'm thinking a trip to Dallas to go see the uh, the grassy knoll and go do a tour around there of all the locations would be a, it might be a fun uh, fun thing. So we're thinking about that anyway. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about what what's coming up. So Red Met, you guys asked about Red Met, and Red Met commented on the channel. I'm going to tell you Red Met was a. Um, um, an informant, he owned and operated an adult bookstore in Chicago, and they were muscling him, Frank Schweiss and uh, uh, that whole Grand Avenue crew was coming in and, you know, had the muscle on him. So, Red wrote a book, and uh, as a matter of fact, if you're watching, Red, it just showed up today. Thanks for the, uh, the autograph. That was nice of you. Red, what? Uh, read a uh, wrote a book and <clears throat> I read it and interviewed him and being that he did you know he wore he was an informant I mean and he he's proud of it it's opposite of what Frank would have thought so of course I asked his brother I said Should we interview Red I mean would that be good and you know would that be okay which for those of you who, who are wondering by the way um, Joe, because I started this with Frank, I'm now doing it with Joe, okay? But Joe's like not really going to be on a whole lot, although we do have some good footage of Joe. So that's going to be coming up, um, him telling a few stories and uh, taking us around. Anyhow, so Twin Cities Billies, Frank was an informant. Okay, so I guess it's a, if you play with the words, if you, if you play with the words informant, or government witness, I guess it's the same thing, one and the same. The difference, however, is is that an informant wears a wire, goes around, or brings people or bugs a place and intentionally brings people in to get information, whereas a government witness just testifies about the things that he did. So that's the difference. And uh, that's right. So that's what he needed to do. Anyhow, so, okay, so you, you see the point. All right, now... Uh, so I, I interviewed Red, and it's it's a, it's a damn interesting interview. I'm almost done editing it, uh, and I'm going to be putting that up soon. The people who prescribed, it'll probably be up tomorrow for you guys, and then Monday, it'll be up officially on the channel. Thanks, Cindy. How are you doing today, dear? I'm also done editing your video. I, uh, I, I, I got a video of Frank marrying a couple inside Tony Spilatro's house here in Las Vegas. So that video is going to be up there for the prescribers. Of course, we had to blur the faces and that's what, uh, that's what took me a little while. So, uh, anyway, so that's happening now. Last night, last night I interviewed someone and it was a really, really interesting interview. So you guys remember Frank being asked about Harry Aylman, right? Uh, Harry Aylman. Harry, is it Harry the Hook Aylman? I want to say is what they said. Uh, they used to call him Harry the Hook. That's right. Twin Cities Billy. That's right. So <clears throat> last night I sat down and for 45 minutes I interviewed Frankie Forliano. Frankie was Harry Aylman's stepdaughter and he became her stepfather when she was nine years old and her perspective of Harry Aylman is a lot different than what you guys have heard or read about in the past very different believe me extremely different so uh, so we sat and we did that uh, we did we did that interview Frankie Forliano, Frankie Forliano, Frankie Forliano. Steve, there, I did it, I said it, okay? <laughs> um, anyhow, she put a book out. She wrote a book about her father, and we talk about the book in the uh, in the interview. And that's, uh, that's They Can't Hurt Him Anymore, which is uh, all about what it was like growing up with Harry as a father. So, pretty interesting uh, interview. So, 
Hey Ryan, how are you doing? Um, George, thanks for watching. I appreciate it. Okay, so today we're not sitting at my house in my room in front of my computer. We're out here in my car and we're um, and we're on location at a place that I'm going to tell you about and I'm going to show it to you uh, in a in a couple of minutes. Okay, so let's talk about and I and the reason I'm here, by the way, is because of the interview last night with Frankie. Okay, so. <laughs> What do you think I'm here to amuse you, Steve? You think I'm funny? Uh, okay, so Mickey, I can't wait for you to join the page. Do you know much about the C Note Street Gang? Um, actually, uh, actually, yeah, a little bit, um, a little bit. I think I met a couple guys that may have uh, may have been in it recently. So I don't want to talk a lot about that though. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about where we are today and why we're here is because I got new information I never knew before, never knew. Uh, the old owner of the mob tour, he used to say something about, I think he just made, made it up to be funny to be honest with you, but th this is information I never heard before. So you guys are going to get this for the first time right here, right now. Okay. Frank Lawrence Rosenthal. You may know him as Frank Lefty Rosenthal. Born June 12, 1929. He grew up in Chicago and he was an odds maker. He was very, very good at it. Um, he ran the largest bookmaking operation in Chicago and he did it for the outfit. Okay. Uh, so, uh, he did that for the. Sorry, my phone's ringing. It's, that was Ori Spado calling. I have to call Ori back. Uh, Ori doesn't must not be watching. Um, <laughs> anyhow, so uh, he's got a, he had a lot of heat coming on him in Chicago, so he moved down and ran his operation out of Miami for a while. Uh, he was subpoenaed, and, and this is I understand he got the nickname Lefty because of this. He was a subpoenaed to appear before. Uh, U.S. Senator John McLennan's subcommittee on gambling uh, and organized crime. He was uh, accused of matchmaking, and during that, uh, during that, he invoked the Fifth Amendment 37 times. So I plead the fifth. I plead the fifth. I plead the fifth. And he was understand that's why he got the name. Vegas, 1968. He comes out here and he's overseeing the Stardust, the Marina, the Fremont, the Hacienda. Okay, the Stardust, obviously, that's where the new uh, uh, um, resort world is. Hacienda is where Mandalay Bay is, or Hacienda is where Mandalay Bay is. The Fremont is still standing downtown and the Marina is still on the strip, but it's part of the MGM. Maybe I'll do a video about that and show that to you guys, but they stripped the marina and then they re, they reskinned it and incorporated it into the new MGM instead of tearing it down and rebuilding something. Anyhow, he's overseeing all of those casinos and he is um, he's overseeing all those casinos and he's skimming the money you know, overseeing the skim. Lefty was known for putting the first sports book within a casino inside. Before, up until this point, sports books were on, you know, they were out and about, right? On their, their own buildings, in other words, on the strip. Inside the Stardust, he had a big sports book. So he was the first to do that. He also hired a majority of female blackjack dealers. That was another thing that Lefty did that other casinos weren't doing. And that increased their business a whole lot. Because, I mean, who doesn't want to play blackjack with a girl? Right. And so anyway, um, so he met Jerry McGee and got married May 4th, 1969. Julie Curtis, I am in Vegas. Yes, right now. I'm going to show you where I am in just a moment. I'm going to let's just build up to this for a second. Um, they got divorced in 1981. It was a, a very tumultuous marriage. OK, uh, they didn't it didn't work out with these two. I mean, it worked out for a minute because, you know, she, he knew how to make money and she knew she liked spending money. So it worked out that way. 
Uh, she did have a child with Lenny Marmer before they met, but once they met, Lefty had two children with her, uh, Stephen and Stephanie, and uh, those were the kids that he had with Jerry McGee. Okay, so everything that was going on in the town at that time, you had Tony Spilatro was out here. He was sleeping with Lefty's wife. That's a big no-no. I mean, you don't do that in the mob. You don't go sleeping with another guy's wife. So he was doing that. Um, of course, he was giving Frank the okay to do all these robberies around town, and and uh, which he he shouldn't have, you know, done that and given him the okay. So a lot of things were going wrong out here. So as you guys know, um, let's see, Frank Rosenthal's car was bombed. It was bombed October 4th, 1982, which would be 38 years and 20 days ago that the bombing took place. And who did this bombing? You guys, if you guys saw in the thumbnail, you see the, the um, in the thumbnail, you see the pictures, there's pictures of the car. And uh, there's pictures of the car in there. I'm gonna show you those in just a minute. Cindy, how come my wife doesn't co-host with me? Allie, babe, she's at home right now. Hi, Allie. She's at home. And whenever she, you guys see something pop up that says thank you to so-and-so or whatever, and it's from Coffee with Colada, that's Allie. And I love you, babe. Okay. So she's sitting there watching it. Yeah, there she is. Okay. So, so uh, yeah, Cindy, she, she works with me, and we, we, we definitely do that. Okay. So Frank Ballesteri, Twin Cities Billy, that's a possibility. Um, up in Milwaukee that Frank Ballesteri was the one who bombed um, the car. Another possibility that people thought was Tony. Tony was sleeping with Jerry McGee. Maybe he wanted to get Lefty out of the picture. It's a possibility, but really not likely. Not likely at all. Could have been the outlaw bikers because, you see, Jerry McGee had made new friends. Remember, she went and got the safety deposit box had a coin collection, had some money. She ran through all of that money. She ran off with her, her uh, biker friends and they partied in California. She was doing a lot of drugs, so were they. There was still a life insurance policy on, on Lefty. So maybe the bikers said, let's go bomb his car, we'll kill him. And then she collects the insurance money and then keep partying. So that's another possibility or which is the most likely and it's what frank believed it was the kansas city mob it was nick sevilla over at the kansas city mob that did this the car bombing now we are on location at the car bombing site so i am going to jump out and show you guys a little bit about this so come on with me let's go outside and let me flip this camera around there we go Okay, I'll shut the door. So this was the Tony Romas over here, okay? Now it's Hustler Hollywood, which I guess if they would have, you know, maybe if they would have let them film here whenever, uh, when they were making the movie, if they would have filmed right here, maybe this place would have had enough popularity that it would have stayed Tony Romas. Who knows, we'll see. Across the way, this is Marie Callender's, or I should say was Marie Callender's, okay? It's not Marie Callender's any longer. It also is shut down. So um, so this is the lot okay, that we're in. Now, right behind me, let's flip this around. You guys see this post right back here? That, if you look in the thumbnail, is the, it's the spot right here where the car was sitting. The car was facing Tony Roma's. Let's turn it around. This side. This side. This I side. Here. I can tell you it was right here. Okay. Hold on. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm doing a YouTube right now. Do you mind if I if I have you on there? Sure. Yeah, what's your name? Zach. Zach? Yep. Zach. This is Zach. Where do you work, Zach? Over right here at here, Hustler Hollywood. Okay, and where did you work before? Uh, before this, I worked at Escapeology. Okay. And then I moved out here. Uh, when I moved out here, I actually knew the history of the building before I started here. Okay. Because I had been by before, and I'm a big fan of the movie and everything. You lived in town? Uh, yeah, I lived in town. I was from South Carolina beforehand. Okay. And I moved out here, and I started working here, and yes, I park here every day in the space. Oh, okay, so uh, 
we've always thought for years, now we run the Vegas Mob Tour. Right. For years, we've said it's this spot because in the picture of the blown up car, right. this post is here, right. right? This post is right here and you can see it. Are you telling me he was facing this way? He was facing this way, the car was here. You can see the post here because you can see all these marquees in the background of the picture. Okay. Let's take it from this direction. All right, I gotta go back and look at this picture that, again. You can see it right here, this. Okay. But that's why I always park here, because I always park here. So all right, so there so there you go. All right, so. Uh, but we have a good many people come in the store and ask about it. Uh-huh. Everything's pretty much changed in the store except for our bathrooms. Sadly, right. I can't let anybody in the bathrooms, but right. they are original to the thing, which is pretty cool. Uh-huh. Because they look like the old Tony Robles bathrooms. So that's sure. neat. Awesome. Uh, huh? But also down the road here at uh, Tower Jewels. Tower Jewels, that was Bertha's, right. That was Bertha's. That's yeah. where they robbed. And up here at Golden Steer, uh, Toy Spilatro used to take meetings a lot. So. Awesome. Yeah, well, hey. The road's got a lot of cool stuff. Cool, man. Well, hey, thank you for that. I appreciate that. No All right, dude. You have a good day. Okay, so a cool chance meeting with somebody who works here who's saying that it's on this side over here which we're gonna have to look at this picture really really closely and uh we'll take a look at that i'll re-edit it when we get home okay so frank said that according to him anyhow let me flip this back around so the car was here over here okay over here is where he thinks there were two guys or three guys sitting in a car with a remote and they were watching and when lefty came out got into the car they pushed the button across the way and that's how the uh that's how the the bomb was detonated it wasn't wired to the car or anything like that now this is what's really cool last night last night while I was interviewing Frankie, she told me something I'd never heard before. So Lefty had a driver and the driver, this guy used to take Lefty around this place, that place. Frankie was dating him, dating this driver. So she heard about the car bombing on the TV, the radio, she called him up and it just so happens that the kid was sick and he wasn't there that day to drive lefty lucky for the kid right that he wasn't there so that's the that's the information anyway i just got and i thought that's pretty pretty damn interesting but what i was going to say in the beginning is what robert used to say was that um was that lefty used to tip the a kid to go out there and start his car every time he would leave because Lefty ate like a steak every every day, and uh, this was one of his favorite places to go and eat. So anyway, Robert would say that he would tip the kid to go out there and start the car, and that day somebody tipped the kid not to go out there and start the car. But I guess the real story is, is that his driver was sick that day. <sighs> Lucky for the driver. So, okay guys, I am pulling out of here. And I figure, I guess you guys are liking this. Gary, thank you very much for getting a shirt, buddy. I appreciate it. Um, if he's correct, get that guy a Colada shirt. I'm going, uh, you know what? We'll do something for him if he's right. I, but I got to go back and look at that picture and study the picture a little bit more because it, 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 was, it was supposed to be, uh, we always thought on the other side, on the other pole. So anyway, um, I may have an opportunity, if I ever get a chance to hook up with him. Um, I have an ex-Metro cop that wants to, uh, that is willing to do an interview, and he was there the night that Bertha's jewelry store, uh, the Bertha's jewelry store robbery went down. Now, I'm just driving a, a two blocks, because now we are, and let's just wait until I get, completely stopped here at this light. Now we are at Tower of Jewels. And this is the, uh, this was Bertha's jewelry store. This is where it went down. This is where they all got arrested. So let me set you guys there. We're gonna pull in and I'm gonna give you guys a little bit of a, a uh, little bit of a quick tour 
of uh, what all happened and where it happened here at Bertha's Jewelry Store. So, are you guys enjoying this today? Uh, I went on the tour with Frank and Lewis. I believe, Adam, you are right. Yeah, I, I, I think so, but I who knows? I've been wrong before, once. No, I wasn't wrong that time. Mm -mm. Well, wow, this has got to be the longest light in Las Vegas. Okay, so here it is, uh, 1981, 4th of July. Um, 4th of July, 1981. Frank had been arrested for the stolen furniture inside his house. And let's clear this up too, okay? Because you guys are, <laughs> you got a lot of, we've got a lot of comments about our last uh, interview that we had on, which was David Bowman. Here's, a, here's all I have to say. Why would Frank help David Bowman get his book written if David was lying about what happened? It doesn't make sense, okay? It just doesn't make sense. He wouldn't have helped him. So, you know, he's not lying. Elaine, his wife, told me that, you know, he, uh, that the guy did. He broke into the house. He did. He stole from from the house so that part's all a hundred percent true um the rest of it yeah i i can't verify any of it the rest but the, of his story but it went down okay so that's the deal with uh yeah see you don't think that he's lying either i don't know why he'd be lying i have no it's no reason for him to um and He's an unusual character, but you know, he still is, uh, I think was genuine, you know, genuinely sincere in what he was saying. So, so that's my take on it. And again, I, w I sat in the room with him and, and did the interview and that's what my gut said to me anyway. Okay. So yeah, that's still a long light. You know, I'm, I'm turning around. I'm, I'm going to go the other way. I'm going to, we'll get, we'll get in there. Uh, we will definitely get in there. So Frank is uh, going to be laid to rest uh, next week. That's when that's going to happen. The families pick the day next week. And when that happens, I'll let you guys know uh, what day and when, it, when that goes down. Um, when, that, when that goes on, I should say. Um, uh, okay, David. David Grimp. I think you are right but he was still on coke when you did the interview. You know, he, he, he doesn't lie about doing the drugs. He says that he did a lot of drugs. I believe that he did, okay? About that, I think, <coughs> excuse me, it may have Sometimes when people do that many, you know, drugs for that long, it, it messes them up a little bit and they, they get a little nervous twitches or, you know, this kind of thing just from doing so much. I don't think he was high when, when just telling you guys how it is. I don't think that he was on anything when I did the interview. I think it's just, uh, it's, um, yeah, so I, that's what I, I'm thinking anyway. Okay, <clears throat> so... As soon as this light changes, we'll get through here. Now, the night of the 4th of July, on the rooftops, and again, we're back at this light. There's Tower of Jewels, there's City Impact. There were FBI agents on the top of City Impact. Across the street, commercial center here, they got uh, the Spotlight Lounge, and over here was a dentist office. That dentist office is not there any longer. That dentist office uh, is changed. So it's not a dental office anymore. Oops, almost dropped the camera. Okay. Let's get into here. Another U-turn. Okay, so they were hanging out on top of the rooftops. Remember, Frank and Tony had just brought Sal Romano onto the crew, and Sal was also, he was an informant, and he was wearing 
a wire and oops he was wearing a wire and feeding the feds information so they knew when and where this was going to go down jewels yeah Let's get this window down here okay up in the front where you see that black sign that says we buy gold right under there is where the vault is located or was located. I have photos, by the way, of Frank in the vault. He got to go into the vault at Tower of Jewels. They let him in there one day. Don't ask me why. C City Impact. Hey, uh, yes, that's right. There were federal agents outside. City Impact's watching right now. That's uh, that's awesome. Okay, so, so here in the back, okay, in between this little alleyway right here, uh, this is where they pulled up in a white van. Remember, 4th of July, 1981. They got a white van and they brought ladders and they put the ladders up on the roof. They climbed up onto the rooftop and then they walked forward. I also understand that on this building, there were also agents and police up on the rooftop hiding in the back. They waited. Let's turn around. They waited and sat up there until the... Um, gang actually entered the building they couldn't just uh they couldn't just arrest them until they actually made entry so they had to wait and it took a couple of hours a banging through the rooftop to uh to create a hole to get in and the first uh hole that they made they were off by a few feet so um yeah, they were off a few feet, so they had to redig the hole, uh, you know, remake another hole, bust another hole. And the feds, they had to wait that whole time while they were breaking another hole. Well, you see these guys, some of them worked in Vegas, but some of the feds that were here were from other places. They had to bring them in. They needed a bigger team. So these guys weren't used to the heat in Las Vegas. And I'm telling you, in Vegas, it can be a hundred and stupid out in the, in the middle of July or beginning of July. Just, it's hot. July and August are hot months. 110, 115. Anyhow, they had they had record heat. And I, from what I understand from Dennis Arnoldy, who was an FBI agent who was here, he said that that uh, two of the guys had to be taken off to a, a, the hospital for heat stroke. Two of the agents. So it was a pretty hot day. And think about these guys. All the agents were doing was just hunkering down, right, watching the watching the guys. These guys were boom, boom, you know, banging away and cutting. And so, yeah, yeah, Steve Cutler, they say it's a dry heat. Yeah, the oven's a dry heat too. But you don't crawl in there and have a picnic, right? So, okay, so this is what happened. As soon as they gained entry and the gang dropped in, as soon as they, they uh, gained entry and dropped in, this place lit up like, like, you know, like the, like Christmas. I mean, every, everywhere, cop cars. Now, right across the street. Okay, let me see if you guys can see from here. Across the street, commercial center. That's where, um, that's where the van with Larry Newman, who had Sal Romano in the van, but Sal had to, said he had to get out to go to the bathroom. Uh, and then he didn't get back in didn't come back so he ran off because he knew that the bust was about to happen uh, that's where they all got arrested and pulled over right across the street in that uh, in commercial center so that's where that happened and and the cop that I I want to interview the officer that that was uh, there that day he actually was the one who went into the uh, van with a shotgun stuck it in Larry Newman's face so anyway I gotta try I gotta give him a call and and uh, Get with him so we can do an interview anyway hey guys i appreciate uh, you guys hanging out with me this afternoon i have to go do some errands and pick some things up uh, there is more content coming i do promise you that and uh thank you all let me just go through here and see if we had any comments posters for frank no they didn't uh no posters not on the site we don't have any of that up yet um Sal Romano sold out, yes. Did David Bowman embellish the story? Back to David. Okay, so again, guys, my gut says no. It says David's telling the truth. Um, that's what I think. But, you know, everybody, 
can make their own opinions and their own decisions. That's what this is about, you know. It's not about me uh, telling you guys one way or the other. It's um, you guys. You guys make your decisions for yourself. I'm interviewing these these people that I've been interviewing, and I've been trying to do it very unbiasedly and just to get their story. So. Um, yes, I will post some of the pictures that I had of Frank. We're still putting together another slideshow, so uh, that's going to be a second one that's going to go on with some more pictures of him. So, no, the funeral is not going to be open to the public. Uh, Johan, love your channel, love you too. Uh, Cindy, thank you. God bless you too. Thanks for letting me use your video, by the way, again. Um, he's definitely smiling up there. Kevio, keep it going. All right, man. Yes, yes, yes. Hold on. Larry Newman was a dirty gog. What the, what's a dirty gog? Tony Montana, I don't get that. Sean Pender, I'm glad you enjoyed it today. Gary, thanks for prescribing, buddy. Um, we'll see you guys next Saturday. And uh, NL Berglov, hey, thank you very much. I appreciate you supporting the channel. I appreciate that, pal. Um, Catamaran channel, keep it going. I'm trying. We're uh, we're trying to come up with what we're coming up with. So, I hope that you guys are enjoying enjoying it. Dirty dog. Okay, that's what I, I was thinking. Maybe you meant dirty dog. So I wasn't sure. Steve Cutler, thanks. I'm glad that you're enjoying the content. Um, the van with Sal Romano. You missed my super chat. I'm sorry, dude. Thank you very much. I appreciate uh, I appreciate your support. Um, Mario, thanks. I appreciate uh, Twin Cities Billy. Uh, COVID wasn't one of the conditions he did have. Yes, um, uh, the certificate said the the uh, death was due to acute respiratory failure syndrome, something due to pneumonia and due to COVID. So it, it's on the death certificate, yes. Uh, you're welcome, Neon Vacation. Thank you, Sam Anthony. I appreciate that. Uh, when you put more material on your other website, MacGyvered Media. Oh, Brett, so you ask about MacGyvered Media. I gotta tell you, uh, Eddie, my buddy Eddie, he's, uh, he's a tour guide for Vegas Specialty Tours. And Eddie and I went out to the Seven Magic Mountains the other day to, um, we went out there to go do some some uh, stories about Seven Magic Mountains. It's a piece of land art. And anyway, we, uh, we got a DJI drone. This thing is awesome. It goes up 1,600 feet in the air. You can fly it like four miles out. It comes back, it shoots 4K. And we got it so that when we're making these videos, we can put some aerial footage into the uh, the shots, it would be really cool to have some aerial footage of the different locations. I was thinking about bringing it with today and just flying it over the roof of Tower of Jewels, you know, so that we could, as we tell this story, we could sh actually show the rooftop. Um, so there's going to be more stuff that's going to be happening on MacGyvered Media, as well as the Vegas Specialty Tours channel, uh, also, and. Um, I also have a personal channel. It's been up there on YouTube for, I think since YouTube started. I wanna say I started my channel in 04, and I wanna say it was like six months after YouTube launched. And I just put my channel up there to, uh, um, to show some of my magic videos to different people. Uh, it's still there, and I'm thinking of adding content to it, just doing like a lifestyle channel, maybe. Um, I, since I got back from, from Chicago, my God, I ate so much food in Chicago. I didn't stop eating food in Chicago, by the way. Pam, if you're watching, that dinner was awesome. It was fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, it was really, uh, Joey, uh, I'm just, it was such a great time. So what, what did I eat? The question is, what didn't I eat? <laughs> okay, I ate everything. Uh, Steve Cutler, didn't know you were on America's Got Talent. Want to see the video, please? I was on America's Got Talent twice, actually. The first time was the first season. The second time was a couple of years ago. Um, and I didn't get very far with it. So, although they put me through on stage, they didn't on the show. So, um, anyway, so that's, that's that. 
anyway on the on the uh, other channel I'm thinking about doing like I said a lifestyle channel because uh, three days ago I started keto and I haven't eaten any carbs for three days because when I got back from Chicago I got on the scale and I went oh my god so I didn't eat any carbs for the last three days and yesterday I got up today I dropped six pounds six pounds man since yesterday boom just like that and I was thinking about making a video about it because I plan to do it for the next several months to get back to a pretty, uh, uh, just to get skinnier. So I may do that anyway. Yeah, I ate, uh, um, I ate so much stuff. Intermittent fasting, that's what, that's what my wife Allie's doing right now. She's doing some intermittent fasting. She's doing really good. She's starting a channel also called, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's funny okay that's that's funny thank you Frank um, <laughs> what a jag off so <laughs> um, wow you lost 10 kilograms in 10 weeks yeah last time I did this I was losing like it's crazy it was fast at first and it was like two pounds a week and it just stayed that way I did that for a few months and yeah anyway um, and then I was pretty comfortable. And then when I got sick, that I lost more weight. And then after that, I got sick. I was a little depressed, and I gained weight. And I, you know, so little is an understatement, by the way. Um, uh, da -da -da -da. Your home in Canada. Put some material together. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> how much was a sick? How much that six pounds of the food left over from Chicago? telling you I ate so much food in Chicago we were we were pigs when we were there unbelievable uh, anyway yeah Allie's starting a chance she's been doing so good she's been working out every day she's lost a lot of weight so, so we want to start a, another channel uh, about her little lifestyle channel so anyway hold on why do you delete comments uh, H S A D E H what did you write that I deleted because if I deleted it, it's probably because it was inappropriate. I'm just saying. And if you're gonna leave a comment that's not appropriate, then it's gonna get deleted. So that's that's what it is. Every comment that is posted in the comments, every single one, I personally sit there and read and approve. And if somebody writes something that's really out of line, I'll take the comment down and if somebody does it repeatedly then I'll remove them from the from the channel so that's I hope that answers your question okay guys I delete comments which are racist or attack others exactly so I mean it's just if it's if it's inappropriate you know you can have your opinion but you, you don't need to be a jag off okay so that's that anyway all right guys I uh free speech Free speech. Yes, free speech. Not on YouTube. I don't think. They censor a lot of things. Some some things you can't say. So I'm learning about that. Anyway, take care, guys.